Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. May our lips pour forth his praise. Amen. Psalms 119, 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stay from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Isaiah 55, 10-13 The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to. And it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. The word of the Lord. Father, we come to you today on this day that you created. You being the great creator, we ask you to continue to create love and joy in these circumstances. God, I pray that all of my family at Vandalia knows that they are loved and that I miss them. I pray that no one feels lonely or isolated and that you give us the ability to check on one another and to not let these spatial circumstances prevent us from showing the love of Christ to our brothers and sisters. God, I want to pray for those who are on the most vulnerable sides of our community, those who struggle already with economic income and with social circumstances. God, I pray that during this time, you allow the privileged and, and those that are in positions where they don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from, don't have to worry about not having friends or family. God, I pray that you allow our hearts to be softened and that you allow us to know what it feels like and to know that we aren't so different from the people that we may put into those boxes. Father, thank you for continuing to create joy and love. Thank you for giving us a life to live, and please let us live every moment intentionally and joyfully. Thank you, Lord, for giving us resources to be able to have meetings like this, and please be with everybody throughout the rest of this Sunday and the rest of this week. In your son's name, amen. Hi, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. Jocelyn and Margo and Isla and Benjamin and I are, are all doing well. Um, like uh, Sherry said last week, we have our ups and downs, but uh, overall we are we're doing well. Um, uh, speaking of Sherry, I want to say I'm, how grateful I am for her uh, reflections and stories and message last week. Um, that was a real uh, blessing, and I, I'm really grateful for uh, you, Sherry, uh, and for Stacy as well, um, for the great blessing that you are to this community. And uh, I'm really grateful for your willingness to share your, um, your story with us last week. So thank you for that. This week, we are going to be in Matthew 13. 
the story leading up to the one that we that we hear in chapter 13 uh, is a story of the revelation of the Messiah among a people who, for the most part, for one reason or another, refuse or are unable to recognize him. He doesn't seem to fit the part. On the surface, he appears to be brooking all the rules, castigating respectable authorities, assuming the authority to teach and to forgive sins and heal, and doing so in God's name and under messianic titles. He's known as the son of David, and yet he refuses to be made king. He seems like a rebel, and yet he refuses to lead an army or kill. And ultimately this is leading toward Golgotha, toward a cross, toward humiliation, shame, and death. And here in chapter 13, we're right in the middle of the story. And if we're there with him, listening to him from the seashore, as he stands in a boat and addresses us, we're still not quite sure where all this is heading. So, in this way, we encounter Jesus, right in the middle of Matthew. And when he speaks to us this time, what he offers is a kind of strange, simple story of a farmer sowing seeds. It says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not listen nor do they understand. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. You will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, so that they might not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but didn't see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. As we sit with this story, we can see that it expresses some fundamental features of what it means to be human. And not simply what we are called to do, but to be, as followers of this Messiah and members of this kingdom and this body. In particular, just 
kind of let the various kinds of soil he mentions simmer in your mind for a moment. The path, hard, firm, packed down after years, maybe generations of people walking across it. An area of land unable to take in the seed any deeper than the surface, so that the seeds are easily lost, plucked away. The rocky soil, where the seed is able to fall beneath the surface and seems to grow, but has no room or ability to really take root or flourish. Plants here don't last long and die easily. The soil littered with thorns and weeds, all sorts of things beside the plant itself competing to make their home in the soil. At our uh, current house, we have for the first time, at least in my uh, life, a pecan tree. I had no idea what this would mean. <laughs> um, not to not to mention the gazillion uh, pecans that end up on the ground um, that we have to take care of, um, which I, I can appreciate the pecans, but I had no idea that I would have to dedicate so much time to monitoring the ground for these pecan saplings. These things are everywhere, constantly, showing up in all sorts of unexpected places across the property, trying to take over the ground. And while we're already paused at this point in the story, in Jesus' parable, notice, going back to the parable, that without any argument, it's, a, it's just assumed as a, a presupposition in the story that the cares of the world and the lure of wealth are deeply at odds with the life of faith. The word of this kingdom planted in the heart is not one of health and wealth for me and mine. It's a word of dying to self, of identifying in solidarity with suffering people and oppressed people, caring more for their needs and their good than my own. The lure of wealth is therefore one of the things that chokes off and tries to displace the word of this kingdom, to make the heart its home instead. And then finally, the healthy, rich, soil that's clear of rocks and weeds and open enough to take in the seed and let it grow deep roots. What we have is a is a rich set of metaphors to dwell on in this passage. One of the things that this story does in particular through these metaphors is highlight the fact that our lives are composed not of disconnected bits and pieces, but rather our lives form over time in certain ways. Certain patterns develop. Certain kinds of things seep into them, permeate them. Certain tendencies and habits form and take root one way or another, for better, for worse. This is a helpful way for us to, to think or rethink what it means to be human beings and also what it means to be followers of Christ, adherence to this gospel, to let our hearts be home to the word of this kingdom. We are not simply creatures of isolated, detached choices, moving from one disconnected moment to the next, one insular vacuum-sealed situation followed by another. Those various situations of our lives, the various small and large choices that we make, can have the appearance, sometimes, of being disconnected, but really they're all interwoven. They carry us along. They form one network, one ecosystem. And our lives are defined not so much by separate choices, but by patterns of choices, by habits, ruts and grooves that form within us, roots of one kind or another, that grow and take hold in our hearts, and which shape our lives, our communities, our economies, our histories. Sin and saintliness, vice and virtue, are really, deep down, words about overarching traits that define our lives in deep, ongoing ways. They are trajectories, directions. Or to come back to the, uh, the original metaphor, our lives are like the long-term life cycle of soil. We settle into place 
and become well adjusted to some things rather than other things. And the past, as Charles Taylor has said, becomes the sediment of the present. Paths don't form overnight. Soil doesn't become filled with rocks or thorns instantaneously. These things take time. They're snapshots in a story, but they express a, a memory, the long-term character and formation of the soil. Roots take time to grow. And when they do, when they're allowed to make their home in the soil, they grow deep and strong. They even displace other things that are put in their path, like sidewalks and driveways. They hold trees in place in the face of thunderstorms and haboobs. Now, step back from the story. What is the point of all this? Why does Jesus tell this story? And why does Matthew include it in his version of the Gospel story? What's the point? Well, for one thing, this is not, contrary to the way I think it's often described, this is not a story about faith and doubt, or about losing your faith in the face of obstacles, um, at least not in the way that we might think. The various people or groups of people in, in ancient Palestine that Jesus might have described as falling into these different categories, these different kinds of soil, could all potentially believe the same set of ideas about the existence of God, God's presence and work in the world. But what distinguishes these different kinds of groups represented by the different kinds of soils, not necessarily the content of their beliefs, but the overarching shape and character of their lives, their contexts. And if we're able to take an honest look at ourselves, at our communities and contexts and culture, of which we are a part, we might see that the, the sediment and soil that forms our lives is filled with a lot of greed, discrimination, inequality, and prejudice that has seeped in and permeated our lives and contexts. Historically, as Cornell West has said, echoing Martin Luther King Jr., the forms of religion in the West have become generally, in a lot of cases, well-adjusted to avarice, well-adjusted to bigotry. And instead, those in whom the word of Christ's odd kingdom take root are called to be maladjusted to greed, maladjusted to bigotry and racism and inequality, prone instead to costly, sacrificial, self-denying love of neighbor, and to produce fruit accordingly. The real question, then, has less to do with holding on to or losing their beliefs in God, in this story, and it has more to do with their receptiveness to and their willingness to let their whole lives and context be transformed, deep down, from top to bottom, by the message of this peculiar kingdom, whose, me whose Messiah and King will give himself over to hang on a cross, rather than acquiring wealth and status and conquering the world. This requires recognizing that what the parable implies, that Christian faith, Christian life, is not simply believing a certain set of ideas in the head, and it's also not performing the right series of choices in different situations and then escaping into an afterlife. This is not simply a story about a past figure about whom we hold certain beliefs, but a word which is to be welcomed, planted, and allowed to take root. Christian life, faith, salvation, as depicted here in this story, is a matter of turning, now, and for the long term, towards what is good and true. Not simply hearing, but listening to the truth. Not, not simply seeing, but perceiving and understanding what's true and good. What is the difference between these things, between hearing and listening? The difference between hearing and listening, the difference between seeing and perceiving, is a matter of the role of the will, of being receptive and inclined to hear and understand even uncomfortable, costly truths. It's a matter of letting our wills be reformed so that they take on a different shape, they turn in a different direction, so that they can be the kind of soil where good and healthy roots take hold, 
where good and healthy fruit grows. On a smaller scale, you could see the same difference between um, the, the difference between making your kids sort of grudgingly shake hands and apologize and they're actually reconciling. Those are two very different things. In the first instance, their hearts, their wills are not in it. In the second, if they are actually reconciling with each other, then they've actually turned themselves deep down, not just on the surface, but deep down towards each other and away from themselves. They've given up their own self-will and turned their will in real love toward the other. This, in the end, is what we are called to. We're called to let our hearts become soft enough to become the home of these seeds, this word, the word of this peculiar kingdom, rather than all the others that are competing to make our hearts their home instead. And just as removing rocks and weeds and thorns and old rotten roots is difficult, labor-intensive, time-consuming, long-term work, so removing the rocks of greed and bias, the weeds of inequality and prejudice in our own personal lives, in our contexts, in the structures of power, in the institutions, in the infrastructure around us, all of this is difficult, labor-intensive, time-consuming, and long-term work. But that's the ultimate point of the story. That's the fruit he's calling on them to bear. This story is not simply descriptive, but prescriptive. He's not simply saying, this is the way things are, when he tells this story. He's saying, this is the way things should not be. He's saying, commit to being the healthy soil. Turn and be healed. Let the word of this kingdom take root in your hearts. Let's pray. God, we praise your holy name. We pray that you would fill us with your word, with your spirit. That you would illuminate our minds and transform our hearts and turn us so that we may be healed. Plant deep within us your word and let it grow. Uh, let us produce the fruit of your kingdom. We pray all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Have a blessed week. Somewhere in one of my class preparations years ago, I read about an interesting early Christian worship practice. In some parts of the early Christian world, about the second or third centuries, the church would share one single loaf of bread across a whole city or area. Christians, say, in a town like Rome or Athens, would have small house churches across the city where those house churches would worship, each one in their own place. But to feel a part of the larger city church, leaders would break the bread and have parts of it distributed to each house group. The literally shared bread from one loaf would communicate symbolically that those scattered and perhaps unable to be in one place for weekly worship, they were all one body, sharing the one body of Christ. As we have been separated over these months, every Sunday without gathering physically together becomes a little bit harder. We want to see each other smile, to share in common space, and to pass those trays of crackers and grape juice. The tradition which we sometimes may trivialize becomes more and more valued and sought. Our current weekly personal family communion time is a good thing, but we miss the larger church family. One thing that early church that the early church did not have, however, that we do enjoy is electronic media. It's been good to share together from our one church, even though scattered around the Lubbock area, with the common YouTube video. There's no easy parallel here. The one loaf is certainly not the one video. But the sense of something bringing us together, though apart, weekly, around the same sort of time, roughly speaking, is real and important and sustaining. 
I suspect those early Christians felt all the kinds of loneliness and anxiety and fear and uncertainty that we do these days in this time. Sunday worship, bound together however the leaders made it work, was precious and remains so. And at the heart of it all is this simple ritual, communion, that we share, reminding us that we are the body of Christ, serving our world as Jesus served his, ultimately realizing that love and grace matter above all. Blessings to all of you during this time. Amen. Peace be to you, and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord, Jesus Christ, with love undying. Amen.